Hello everybody, my name is Adam Thorne and welcome to the Australian Aviation Podcast. We have a packed week of news to get through before we steam into that. I will introduce our two co-hosts. Uh, up first is Chris Fenton. How are you? I'm very well, thanks, Adam. And you? I'm doing very well, thank you. Awesome. And Jake Nelson, how are you? I'm not bad. I've decided to rep the brand this week. You this have week, done uh, very Adam. well. Um, so for those of you who are who are listening on audio and, and can't see, uh, I am wearing the uh, Australian Aviation cap and the Australian Aviation polo shirt. They look pretty good, don't they? Very good stylish. Branding. Yeah, very definitely, stylish. Definitely, definitely. Black is the new... Black. Yeah, let's move on. Um, so, in many, we're recording this on Tuesday afternoon, and not quite the night before Christmas, but like the week before Christmas, anticipating his building for uh, the night of nights, the Oscars of Aviation and all the Thornies. The Thornies. Uh, we are, of course, talking about the not second annual Australian Aviation Awards. Chris. Is anyone going to turn up? What's happening? Is this going to be a success or not? What's going on? I am pleased to say it is almost sold out. <laughs> like, we have close to 500 people 500 in the room people. this Thursday night for the Thornies. I'm going to set you a challenge. <laughs> so, Adam will be doing a, a, a welcome speech uh, at, at the start of the night. and um, I'm We lock to, the doors so you're not allowed yeah, to leave. Yeah, we lock the doors yeah. so they can't leave and, and we'll give people some food and Bev. But um, Adam, I've got a challenge for you. you. You need to incorporate the thornies into your welcome speech. Well, maybe. Maybe. Do it, my friend. I'm just worried that you'll use this as ammunition to make out that I am an egotistical monster. Which Not at is all. A you are the man, theme. the myth, yeah. the legend that is Adam Thorne. But um, look, it'll be a good night. Jake, Adam and myself will be there. Uh, but it will be a good night anyway. It will be a brilliant yeah. night. Uh, <laughs> enhanced with our presence, of course, um, but it, it's shaping up to be a brilliant night. Very few seats left. Um, Lizzie's phone has been ringing off the hook. Um, excited to announce almost 500 people in the room. Um, I'm I'm excited. I'm looking forward to it. And big shout out actually to Lizzie, Lizzie Whitlock. So Lizzie essentially is on our delegate sales team and she is one of the, the people responsible for getting on the phones and getting making sure everything comes together. Um, and she did an absolutely superb job this year. She so. did indeed. And not only does she sell tickets to the event, she also helps people during the submission process. So uh, if someone was nominated, Lizzie is the person that rings people to say, hey, congratulations, you've been nominated or you've been shortlisted listed as a finalist. So she, she helps right throughout the entire award process. So she's a damn legend. She and, and, and speaking of uh, people who did a great job, how about uh, that uh, the Excellence Award trophy? Yes, yes. So we, we will talk about that a little bit more on the night, but I will talk a bit about it. Um, so we went to, well, me and Chris um, went to an event for a day in Brisbane, and we happened to come across a guy called Zach Briggs. Um, and Zach runs a company called Relic Design and Craft. Now, what he does essentially is get bits of scrap aircraft that have been kind of thrown out and he turns them into um, furniture um, or all, all kind of manner of what's uh, whatnots, desks, lamps, etc. And so the kind of the, the magic of what he's done almost is to say rather than throw these aircraft out, bear in mind all the history that they have, um, he turns them into something that can be reused. So he's, he's recycling something, but he's also kind of keeping the spirit um, of those aircraft alive. Anyway, we bumped into him and uh, I actually bought myself a very nice um, seat belt bottle opener. It's pretty cool. It is pretty cool. Um, and we had a look at his stuff and it was really good. We had a few um, uh, a vo uh, video chats with him and he very kindly agreed to make the Excellence Trophy at Australian Aviation Awards. So the Excellence Trophy is like the, the winner of winners the champion of champions. And so while the, I say the regular winners, I mean, every award is prestigious. Absolutely. We'll get their, their still very prestigious, but regular kind of glass trophy. The ultimate winner will get a completely bespoke trophy made by Zach. Correct. And what's exciting is is our parent company, Momentum Media, actually put on uh, a lot of events each year. Uh, and all of the events have an excellence award. Um but this is the only award this night the, yeah. that has a bespoke trophy. Because it's the best the others, one. Yeah, of course, it's the best one. And I have to say, the trophy looks stunning. It looks very good. And hopefully we will get a picture of it that we can put 
uh, in the awards wrap yes. up to to show our listeners and viewers um, on the Australian Aviation website newsletter what uh, the trophy actually looks like. It's pretty amazing. It has been made from an old aircraft that's been retired. So um, the winner of the Excellence Award on the night, uh, I think, is in for a beautiful trophy. Well, here's a link for you. This is you'll like this. this. You'll like this. If you want to find out more about Zach and his story, get this. There is a feature that we've written on him in the new issue of the Australian Aviation Print Magazine um, for our subscribers. Now, if you want to read that, Chris, yes. what would you have to do? Well, you'd, of course, have to be a member of the best website slash news site in Australia slash the world. Um Australian Aviation. So to do that, simply visit our website, australianaviation.com.au. At the top of the website, there is a memberships tab on the right-hand page of the website. Click on the memberships tab. You can join and become a member. Um, if you're not already a member, we're just shocked as to why you're not. Why wouldn't you do yeah, that? Why, why wouldn't you? Um, but f- a, a special promo that we are running for our podcast listeners and viewers, you can become a member and get the print magazine posted to your house directly four times a year when it's produced, uh, or of course you can read it online. Um, you simply use the discount code podcast at checkout to save yourself 20% off. There you go. That's a, you, can't, you can't ask more than no, that. you can't ask for more than that. So now, you can, but we won't give it to you. No. no. <laughs> okay, welcome back. So on Thursday, we had what was one of the biggest days of news, even in the kind of the, the three and a half years I've been doing this. Um, and it started off um, with the announcement of Qantas's extraordinary um, full year profits and then a load of other uh, things that kind of came to us a little bit by surprise. Jake, tell us about this day of days. Let's start off with Qantas's Monster, monster profit. Marathon, absolute marathon it was of exhausted. a day. There was, um, you know, blood coming, blood on my keyboards. <laughs> yeah, no, it's my fingers were worn down to, to stumps. Um, <laughs> yeah, the the the, the main uh, one, the main event was, of course, the release of Qantas's uh, full year results and everything that stemmed from that. Uh, Two point four six five billion dollar profit for money, Qantas. It? it is a lot of money. Um, I, I need to renegotiate my salary. Uh, but it is, it is a $2.465 billion profit for the financial year. Um, this is a massive turnaround from uh, the the loss, the $1.86 billion loss that it recorded in, in financial year 2022. And so it is the first full year profit for Qantas since 2009. Um, and uh, they Alan Joyce is saying, you know, it's a world away from the seven billion in statutory losses we racked up during COVID. A key difference between this result and our last profit is the one billion in restructuring that is formally complete today. This is a remarkable turnaround. Three years in the making, making it's been hard. He said, from being eleven weeks shy of insolvency to a challenging return to flying across the industry to finally getting back to leading domestic operational performance. Um, so this is, you know, a, 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 a coup, you'd have to think, for Alan Joyce as he heads out the door. He's marking his own homework and he's giving himself an A star. I mean, if I'd had the ability to mark my own homework yeah. when, I was in, when I was in high school, that's what I would have done. So he's done, he's done that. And so this is like the final flourish. This is the last big announcement made by the king... Or Alan so Joyce. you would think. Or so you would think. Because Qantas, uh, because Alan Joyce also announced a tremendous new order of 12 new Dreamliners, 12 A350s um, to replace the bulk of, of Qantas's aging A330 fleet. And in addition, Qantas is going to be retiring its A380s starting in, I believe it was 2031 to 32. So what's interesting is a day or so before this announcement was made, um, Reuters um, sort of had a kind of rumour that Qantas may be buying some more Dreamliners, but at, at the time we had no idea how many. Now, previously, we spoke about on this show and we've reported on the website um, how Qantas was under a lot of sort of stick for just not having enough wide body, you know, long haul aircraft. And particularly, they've had this kind of wet, list, wet lease deal with thin air. Um, essentially to kind of borrow aircraft and crew from um, a smaller sort of Finnish airline to help keep them going. So it didn't sound when they were when they announced that that there was any big aircraft order coming. But just like that, 
uh, Alan has pulled this rabbit out of a hat. This is a monster, monster order. Tell us about the significance of this, because this is 24 big aircraft. Yeah, uh, 24 very, very big aircraft. Not as big as the A380, honestly, which is going to be retired. Um, But these, as I said, they're going to be replacing the bulk of the A330 fleet. Um, So we've got uh, four 7879s, uh, like the ones that they already have. Um, Eight 78710s, so these are the, the, the... Airlines first seven eight seven tens. Uh, there's twelve A three fifty one thousands, which I believe is is it's sort of in addition to the previous announced uh, Project Sunrise and Project Winton orders. So the A three fifty one thousands is what they're going to be using to fly Project Sunrise from uh, you know the East Coast to New York and London nonstop. Um, and this is. Uh, as, as Alan Joyce said, this is a generational decision for the company. They were going to arrive over a decade or more. They'll be part of the fleet for 20 years. Um, he said they'll unlock new routes and better travel experiences for customers, new jobs and promotions for our people. Um, so two dozen new planes are, are, are going to be you know, having the flying kangaroo on the tail. Now, this is one of the things that's interesting about this is that it's almost certainly the last big new aircraft order that they're going to announce maybe for decades. So we know, I think they've officially confirmed something like 46 um, uh, of their domestic fleet, but they've got the option to get more. We know we'll get more. But in terms of like a big new announcement, this is it for a long, long time. Now, as obviously um, Chris now is something of a celebrity in the industry, but back (laughs) in the day, he was humble cabin crew and he and his old friend Alan Joyce would often be cleaning the aircraft together exchanging jokes um you call him Joycey Joycey there you know your your mates and so I want to I want to pose this question to you um with a flourish just like that he's pulled this rabbit out of a hat should he not bearing in mind that he's meant to be on the way out have left this big announcement to his successor Vanessa to make it sounds like to me He's not been very generous with this. What would you say, Chris? I would have thought that this would have been an announcement that could have been made once successor Vanessa had taken Mm. over. Um, However, I guess Joycey on his way out is going out with a bang and look what I did and look what we've achieved and my name's on the dotted line on the order. I I suppose it is a logical time to announce it alongside the results. Yeah, I, well. I totally, I totally understand that. But the, the we spoke when he uh, kind of announced the, the exit date, which I think is November. And I think this was announced a couple of months ago. The AGM in November. Yeah, yeah right. Um, and one of the points that Chris made, I thought, I'm not, which I never occurred to me, but I thought was very correct, is that they were having this transition, and during this transition, it would be a good time for the public to get to know Vanessa correct. in a in a very carefully kind of managed way. Um, and and the thinking might potentially be that um, Alan would take any kind of bad news and would front that, and then would let Vanessa take the wins. It doesn't feel to me like Vanessa's being put very front and centre. This is very much still the Alan Joyce show. I may put to you he's i guess he's proving us all wrong and going out on his own terms and in his own way and good luck to him which but... we should have expected from alan joyce really it is, is is that if, if there's one thing that that man has always done it's things his own way yes that's true very so, true. and I would say, and we've said this multiple times, but if you are listening, Alan, and I'm absolutely sure he is, um, you've had this wonderful end to your career. You've got this big last announcement. But what you need is an exit interview. Absolutely. You need to come on this show and round out this career. So here's what I'm thinking. Come on the show. We'll give you an open forum. We'll chat about everything. If you listen, Alan... That's the last thing to do. The I don't think hurrah. the job is complete until you've come on the show, is what Correct. I would say. Um, now, another aspect of this, just before we kind of wrap this up, um, was that we had a kind of confirmation that Qantas A380s will be um, leaving service. Um, we kind of knew roughly they had another 10 years or so to go, but now we've kind of officially got that that, that, that last marker. Um, Jake tells a little bit more about this because this, is, this means the end of the kind of jumbo jet or the super jumbo era for Qantas. Yeah, so they're going to be retiring them from the 2032 financial year onwards. Um, this is after they confirmed the Dreamliner and, and A350 order. Um, Joy said that the A380 still has a lot of life left in it. They just went under, went, underwent some some recent cabin upgrades. Um, but he he said that uh, they have uh, 
these new aircraft are going to be cutting emissions, reaching sustainability targets. They burn significantly less fuel, especially when moving from a four-engine A380 to a twin-engine A350. Now, this is this comes after these A380s have been returning to service. I think the last two that we're going to return to service have, have already come back um, following the pandemic when a lot of them were sent to the Victorville Boneyard to be put into storage. Um and uh, these are the last of the, the, the huge quad jet planes that Qantas has been flying since they uh, got rid of the, the 747s in, in 2020. So uh, the Queen of the Skies has has uh, left the Qantas fleet and uh, the... What do we call the... The, the blob. The whale. The, yeah, the, I mean, that's not very nice. It's not very, it's not very nice as a nickname, is it? The whale. So the, the, the 74 Kevin becomes the Queen of the Skies and the A380 is just the whale. But that's what it looks like. I think it's a very beautiful aircraft, oh, I'll have no, you know. no. Um, no, but one final point we should discuss is that um, we had Project Winton, which is the name for the domestic fleet renewal. It's pretty much, a, well, it is an entirely Airbus um, initiative. It's entirely air, Airbus aircraft. Very Airbus heavy, yeah. Very Airbus heavy, and it's entirely Airbus. Um, we also then have Project Sunrise, which is a bunch of A350, 1000s or 12, which are specially adapted. Um, I don't know the technical specifications off the top of my head, but basically we've got bigger fuel tanks in order to make that long trip. And so Qantas was very much moving towards being an Airbus airline. So I thought it was slightly surprising that they've gone back in for 12 more Dreamliners. That's a vote of confidence in that aircraft. You'd have to think so, yeah. And I mean, the, the Dreamliner has sort of proven itself as, as, a, as, a, as a pretty decent plane um, since it came into service. You know, you've got all... I mean, Jetstar's got, got Dreamliners. Um, I was surprised to find out that Jetstar had Dreamliners. I, I'd always sort of uh, associated with Dreamliner with the with the upper end of things, but Jetstar's got Dreamliners. And so uh, I think the, the, the Dreamliner has, you know, uh, kind of earned its stripes. And, and I think that... Um, yeah, it, it, it makes sense for, for Qantas to be to be, you know, going with a plane that has already kind of proven itself useful. So and I, I also think what's interesting to note here too is the 787-10, uh, which is included in this new order. Um is a, a perfect replacement for the A330 and the A330's range. Um, so the 787-10 can't fly as far as the Dash 9 version, um, but it's still a fantastic aircraft. Still has good range, but just can't go as far. So uh, for Melbourne, uh, it, it would be a great aircraft, and I'm assuming they're going to be using it on their Melbourne Bangalore service. Um, they will use it anywhere where they're currently flying a long-haul a330. So Brisbane, Los Angeles, for example, the Dash 10 could be a good fit for that. Um, but also including in that order, the Dash 9 variant, um, which does have a longer range. Uh, it's pretty clear that we, I, I'm calling it now, we could probably see some new routes announced by Qantas in the coming months. And this is this is going to be on that note one of the one of the nerdiest things I've ever said. But the Dreamliner is an extraordinary aircraft. It's a beautiful aircraft. Um, and one of the things that makes it so extraordinary. But they don't call it the Nightmare Liner. <laughs> <laughs> right. One of the things that makes it extraordinary is that on the one hand, this is your kind of workhorse, wide body aircraft. It's not as big as the A380. It's not designed to do your kind of ultra long haul, triple seven style routes. But it's, so it, you know, it's your common guard and international long haul route aircraft. But it also has the potential to fly um, very long range as well. Correct. And the idea, of course, that it is um, the aircraft that is flying from London to Perth um, was the first aircraft to do that kind of properly. Um, and much like the um, the MAX as well, again, a lot more long haul than yep. its replacement. So these next generation of aircraft do, like you say, open up new routes, Correct. new possibilities. And they're, and they're using the, the, the Dash 9s on the, the Sydney, Auckland uh, yes. New York route as well. Yep. So uh, they, they, they've already got, you know, form for doing these long haul routes, not, you know, nonstop like the A350-1000, but it's 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 being a very serviceable long haul aircraft. Yep. Um, and for all the negative publicity, perhaps correctly, that the, the MAX has had, actually the Dreamliner has kind of quietly been a big success for Boeing. It shows Absolutely. that actually they still are able to be huge innovators because it feels that is still the aircraft of choice for doing this. Correct. And, and there are a lot of 787 Dash 9s um, and 10s flying long haul flights all around the world each day for various airlines. And um, in Australia alone, the number of airlines that are operating the Dreamliner uh, Dash 9 and Dash 10 variant on their long haul services. United Airlines heavily feature their Dreamliners on, on their uh, 
uh, America to Australia flights. Uh, Air New Zealand is a big Dreamliner carrier. Qantas is becoming a Dreamliner carrier. Uh, Jake, as you mentioned, Jetstar with the 787-8 variant. Um, it, it's a beautiful aircraft, and, and I think it's, it's, a, it's a great choice to replace the A330 for Qantas. I mean, I've, I've flown on a, on a United Dreamliner before, and it was, it was so smooth. It was such a smooth ride, and the the the, the, the fancy tinty windows. That those is were the cool. bit I noticed those first. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, the the and 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 it just it feels nice to fly in a Dreamliner. It does. It purrs. It purrs when it you're in it. Like, it's like some nicely. kind of sky yes. kitten. So welcome back. So we've had this big final flourish announcement from the master, the compare, Alan Joyce, um, and he's it's he's on his he's kind of lap of. Oh, no, I don't know what you want to call it. His, his last lap is, is CEO. Um, but then essentially what happens is he gets called to, I don't want to sort of over journalize it, but he's been he's been put on trial by hauled some before people, a Senate committee. Hauled before a Senate committee to be interrogated by his arch nemesis. It's Darth Vader versus Obi-Wan. I don't know which which is which. <laughs> um, but needless to say, um, we've got um Tony Sheldon, his nemesis, finally one on one versus the Joyce. Extraordinary well, not one on scenes. one. No, it was, was several true. on three because uh, Steph Tully and uh, 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 Andrew McGuinness were also there. So the, um, the lightsabers are out. They're staring each other down. There it they're, is. The they're final marching jewel. towards each other down the street, snapping their fingers. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's a dance off or a lightsaber jewel, but anyway, tell us well, it, more. Sh- it should be both. It should. We be both. should have a combination dance off lightsaber jewel yes. sometime. We need to make this happen. Um, yeah. So. Joyce got called before the uh, Senate Select Committee on the cost of living. Um, there were questions from, uh, you know, uh, from the chair, uh, Senator Jane Hume, uh, from the Green Senator Penny Orman Payne, um, questions from Dean, from Dean Smith, questions from uh, Bridget McKenzie and Matt Canavan. Um, but the, the main event was uh, Tony Sheldon just absolutely laying into Alan Joyce um, and, and, and to a lesser extent, uh, Tef, Steph Tully and, and Andrew McGuinness, but mainly Alan Joyce because... It's- what we've, we've all wanted to see this for a while. This is the yeah. heavyweight clash of the Titans. Uh, it's Tony Sheldon with the steel chair. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, Joyce got Joyce and, and Tully and McGuinness got grilled for 90 minutes by these senators on things like COVID flight credits, on uh, you know, uh, on, on bonuses and you know, executive salaries, on on airfares, on cancellations, on Qatar. They spent a lot of time on Qatar. Um, one of the things that uh, one of the interesting things that that Joyce said he was quizzed about. We've we've discussed. Uh, I don't know if we've discussed on this podcast. We might have done. There's been a lot of them. But uh, the high cancellation rate between Sydney and Melbourne um, because Sydney and Melbourne has, has been seeing some pretty high, uh, a, a lot of cancellations recently. And, you know, the question was was put to Alan Joyce about all these cancellations on Sydney and Melbourne. And essentially what he said was, there are circumstances outside our control at Sydney Airport, um, ATC issues and uh, weather issues, he said, that are meaning we have to cancel flights. And what he said was, we've got a 3.5% cancellation rate. Would you rather we cancel a daily flight to Darwin or a half hourly flight to Melbourne? Because if we cancel the flight to Darwin, then people are going to have to stay in Sydney overnight till the next flight the next day. But if we cancel a flight to Melbourne, we can just shuffle people onto a flight half an hour, an hour or two later. Yeah, no, I mean, the first thing to say is obviously you shouldn't be cancelling. Nobody should be cancelling any flights. I will get that out of the way before we... Well, if, if there are, in all fairness, yes. if there are circumstances outside Qantas's control, and there have been a lot at Sydney Airport lately, mm. if there are circumstances outside Qantas's control, then it kind of has to cancel some flights. Now, the problem with this is, in theory, yes, he is clearly right. It's better to give somebody a half an hour delay than to sort of completely... Right off their trip. Correct. But the, the issue is, and I'm going to give you, and without naming names, I'm going to give you an example that um, two um, kind of very senior people in our company a few weeks ago um, were travelling from Sydney to Melbourne. And the idea was that they'd, they'd travel up very early in the morning, go for a few um, meetings in Melbourne, and then, you know, smash and grab, get out later in the day. And the problem is that their flight got delayed by, I think it was like four hours, by which point they obviously miss their meeting and the whole thing becomes totally pointless. So they say, well, you know what, we're just going to go back to the office. This is it. 
that this is a write-off. But they can't get their money back, or they can't they can't because it's about a cancellation because Qantas or the airline can turn around and go, well, actually, we were able to get you on a flight in a few hours' time. For the for the Sydney and Melbourne flights, often time is of the essence. Absolutely. And the issue here is, and again, there are um, circumstances outside of Qantas or outside of airlines' control, but if you've got a situation where I think the cancellation rate can get up to sort of 10%, which I think the last time we looked, it was 2,500 um, flights. This so is, this was, uh, in the um, first six months of 2023, it was around 2,300 flights between Sydney and Melbourne across yeah. the major carriers. Um, the July figures from Bitra, it was uh, 388 total cancellations between Sydney and Melbourne in July. So this is across both directions. 8.7% um, flights from Sydney cancelled, 8.5% from Melbourne cancelled. The long-term cancellation rate as of July was 2.2%. What I would say, though, is that, and, and again, I understand that the factors outside of people's control and that, that Qantas are trying to, to their credit, use their network to nullify the harm on passengers. But it is coming to something when you have uh, one of the most prestigious air routes in the world that has that many cancellation, cancellations, and we just kind of accept that. Oh, that's just the way it is. Yeah. If you get into the stage where that many flights are cancelled on that important business route, that is an absolute disaster. Correct. And I would ask you as well, that, you know, obviously we may love flying on this show, but it, it's infrastructure, it's transport, it is whisper it away to get from A to B. How many business meetings have been cancelled? How many deals haven't happened? Um, because of this, yep. you, I would make the argument that actually having a cancellation rate this high on the most important route in Australia is doing significant damage. Absolutely it is. And um, to, to Joyce's point in, in the Senate hearing uh, uh, being that would you rather us cancel a flight to Darwin or cancel uh, uh, one of the half hourly services to Melbourne, it, it goes to show the popularity of the route and the fact that people are using it for day trips, business trips, um, to fly down to Melbourne, have a meeting, do some business, jump back on a plane, fly home. Back in back at home in my own bed. So I've I've done those before. Yep. Uh, boomerangs we used to call them. Yep. Used to boomerang up to Melbourne or sorry down to Melbourne or up to Brisbane. Yep. I remember when I actually first moved to Australia. I thought it was I couldn't believe people would just fly somewhere in the morning and fly back later in the day. But that is just that's just part of it's part what, and part, part of part we do. Here, yeah. You know. So. Um, in in the case of our work colleagues here, uh, I know for a fact the cancellation was as a result of a Qantas aircraft. Um, they taxied out. There were a, 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 An indication came on in the cockpit forcing the captain to turn the aircraft back around. So it wasn't a case of they were delayed due to or cancelled due to ATC or things like mm. that. And the only alternative option Qantas could get our colleagues on that day was a flight four hours later, which, as you have already said... Um, they'd already missed their meeting. They were on a plane at 6.30 in the morning to, to a, have been in Melbourne CBD for 9am for a meeting at 9.30. And, yeah, and particularly if it's like a 6.30 flight, then you're probably getting up at, what, half four, five o'clock in the exactly. morning. Exactly. One, one of our colleagues uh, lives on the northern beaches, so he got up at 4am that morning to head to the airport. So you, And you would be. That's the thing. Once you do these things, people are, like, rightly livid. Yep. Well, this is why the good Lord invented Zoom. Well, I mean, but no. yeah, evil word. <laughs> we don't use that. <laughs> evil right word. now, let's move on. Speaking of on, speaking of cancellations at Sydney Airport, um, there was more news that that we that we reported on uh, last Thursday regarding this, which is that Sydney Airport has called for this eighty twenty uh, use it or lose it rule around the takeoff slots to be tightened to ninety five five. Shall I just do my usual blurb where I explain what the slot rule is? Excuse yeah, me. Yeah, well, um, look, I'll uh, nip out and yeah, uh, you grab, a, grab a drink. I want to go to the toilet now is the time yeah. to do it. So for those of you new to the show, um, basically, as, as anyone would, would realise, you can't have two aircraft take off on the same runway at the same time. Not with that attitude. No, you certainly can't because that would be incredibly dangerous. So therefore, you have literally take off time slots. And of course, some slots are more popular and more lucrative than others. So, for example, flights at kind of peak times um, obviously much better than flights kind of in the middle of the day. Um, but there's obviously a lot of competition for those particular times. How do they work out which airline gets the best slots? Well, they use this kind of a uh, quite bizarre but worldwide used system called the 80-20 rule. And what this means is if an airline flies a particular service um, and uses it, 
80% of the time, um, and they can keep that particular time slot forever. Um, and But the argument against that is it means they can cancel one in five flights and effectively block out their rivals. So the ACCC a couple of months ago, um, in a very carefully worded kind of statement, um, said that these rules kind of can be exploited um, not naming any names, by larger airlines, um, I say to sort of stifle competition. And you've got both Bonza and um, Rex who are trying to kind of get in the game of taking on Virgin and Qantas, who are finding themselves kind of blocked out of the best routes, blocked out of the best times, unable to get a foothold, which is really hampering their growth. So there's been a lot of argument as to whether or not we change that rule. I hope you're both back from the Back from doing whatever you've done. For those I've of you, I was in my happy place. Yeah, time. yeah, you were both, you were both dozing off. Anyway, that is the background here. We have to get to the new uh, listeners. So, Sydney, what is Sydney proposing? Talk me through how they would change the eighty twenty rule. So, what Sydney wants is uh, currently it's eighty twenty. Sydney Airport wants ninety five five. So, under this rule, an airport, an airline would have to fly a slot ninety five percent of the time, nineteen times out of twenty to keep the slot. Otherwise, they lose it. I would say to this, without wanting to um, uh, 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 try and get into the minds of Sydney Airport, I think they're saying this knowing they'll never get 95.5, but thinking that they have to kind of come out on that to get 90.10. I think 90.10 is probably secretly what they and the other airlines are pushing for because the argument is with 95.5, you give airlines very little leeway to, to cancel anything. And the argument of, uh, from, from Qantas and Virgin would put forward is that if you're having a 95-5 rule, then you're almost encouraging us to take off when it may not be safe. So you're almost encouraging us to take a gamble. You need some kind of buffer to allow us to safely cancel flights. I personally think it shouldn't count if it's down to a, an uncontrollable mm. Well, situation. Po point of order, airlines do already get dispensations for slot uh, usage uh, due to weather. So oh, okay. if there's bad weather, that. yeah, if there's bad weather, yeah. th this is from this is from Sydney Airport's yeah. submission to the uh, to the standing the House Standing Committee on Economics Inquiry to the into promoting economic dynamism, competition, and business formation. Um, there's a mouthful, but uh, in in its submission, um, it says uh, the, the Sydney Airport said, um, yeah, slot airlines already get dispensations on slot usage due to weather. So uh, if it's unsafe, obviously don't take off. Um, and what Sydney says is the long term cancellation rate at Sydney right now is two point one percent. So um, if you have a five, if if you have a ninety five five rule, then that's two and a half times roughly um, what the long term cancellation route is. Um, Sydney submission says a threshold of five percent for cancellations would give airlines ample buffer for legitimate operational impacts, and if cancellation rates are above this, airlines should be asked to justify why. Well, one of the interesting things, we've been talking about this now for, a, for a, a few weeks or so, and it feels like there's all this kind of noise from the industry. But and purring. And purring, purring, of course, yes. Um, but there's not actually been any kind of um, response from the federal government that suggests they're actually on the brink of moving or changing this this policy. So it feels like, given that there's this sort of all this interest, but a kind of stagnating lack of action, um, Sydney Airport have come in here and sort of tried to force people's hand by going, right, here's a solution. Here's exactly how this is going to work. Because I don't think the current situation at the moment is sustainable. There's too much anger and the anger's not going away. Look, one thing we do really well here in Australia is if it's not broke, don't fix it. And clearly this is broken and it clearly needs to be looked at. And a policy that, that came into play 22 or 20 years ago now, even or possibly even 30 years ago. A while. A, a long time. Um, is clearly no longer suitable for modern day air travel. So um, something needs to change and someone needs to make a change very soon. Um, and Qantas and Virgin have repeatedly denied any accusation that they are gaming the system, any accusation that they are hoarding slots um, in that self Excuse me. In that self-same Senate inquiry um, the other day, Alan Joyce did say it's in our financial interest to be flying all the slots that we have. You know, why would we uh, just be cancelling flights willy-nilly when we could be flying people and making money off it? 
So that's that's one thing that uh, I, I believe it was Alan Joyce that said. Certainly, someone from Qantas said that. I believe it was Joyce. Our lawyers are very grateful for your uh, for your <laughs> statement there. But no, it's true. They they do both of them have come out and and said why would we do that? This will cost us money. Now we've got an awful lot to get through, so we might not be able to cover everything in detail. But yet another um, big story this week was the kind of un- ongoing kerfuffle. Um, I love that word, a kerfuffle, kerfuffle. Um, a kind of sort of strange love triangle um, between Virgin, Qantas and Qatar Airways. And this relates to Qatar being denied um, access or to increase the number of services um, they're flying into Australia. Um, now, Qantas have some, uh, I said such an old man, they've got some beef with Qatar, um, whereas Virgin have less, oh, this is stupid, Virgin have less of a problem with Qatar because they are closer code share partners. So you've basically got Qantas who, it, it would be in their interest, arguably, to deny um, Qatar access to Australia because obviously that's increasing their would competition. Would it though? We'll get to this in a bit. We'll get to this in a bit. But obviously, Virgin, who have a code share announcement, uh, a code share agreement, it's obviously in their interest to have more Qatar flights because that effectively makes Virgin a big international airline again because it opens up so many routes. And of course, it hurts their biggest rival, Qantas. So there's a very messy relationship. Uh, Jake, what is the latest on this? Yeah, so uh, Alan Joyce and uh Co were quizzed about this in the in the Senate estimates hearing as well. Um, uh, Joyce did say yes, we had made representations to the government on the subject. He did not say whether he had personally spoken to the Prime Minister or the Transport Minister about this. He was saying, you know, I don't go into detail about these private discussions if if they did happen. Um, what uh, w- one thing that happened was that uh, Assistant Treasurer Stephen Jones basically came out and said that uh, blocking these extra flights into Australia by Qatar Airways would protect Qantas's sustainability. Um, so what he said was, quote, we can drive prices down, but if we drive them down to a level where it's actually unsustainable to run an airline, instead of having two carriers, we will design our markets in a way which will make it unsustainable for the existing Australian-based carrier. We have a viable airline industry in Australia, and we always want to ensure we're doing things to drive down the cost of airline tickets, but we want to do ensure that they do that in a way that doesn't destroy the industry over the medium and long term. And Virgin Australia has come back and said um, that... Uh, This is from uh, Christian Bennett, the Chief Corporate Affairs and Sustainability Officer at Virgin. He says, quote, Any suggestion that denying Qatar additional flights was designed to protect Qantas's medium to long term sustainability neglects the fact that blocking Qatar damages the domestic and international competitive position of Virgin Australia in favour of Qantas. And he went on to say, Virgin Australia delivers great value and great choice to Australian consumers every day. It is the main source of competition to the Qantas group, and that task is challenging enough without Qantas having public policy designed for its benefit. You know what I love? I'm, I mean this from the bottom of my heart. The thing I love the most about moving to Australia and covering Australian news is that when people are going at each other, they do not care. They are just... Where is, and this is this is a compliment of Australia because Australians speak their mind. There's Absolutely. no nonsense. If this were in the UK... Well, now, there's, like, there's plenty of nonsense. Well, there's, there's, but if this were in the UK, there'd be some very kind of passive-aggressive rubbish statement choosing their words. Whereas here... Gloves off, bang, hey, yes. we bang. believe We believe that, uh, that, 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 that the minister <laughs> should reconsider his position. Listen, is that and, 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 and design a policy that uh, allows <laughs> Froptingshire Airways to to compete on a level playing field with Kabibbity Foops It's Air. not that far off. And I remember when I started covering the news over here, and it was like the first week or two you'd see these, you think, this is unusual. I mean, you realise this actually is a weekly occurrence. Yep. I prefer this because people are a lot more honest here. Yep. You know, there's no nonsense there. So anyway, that was a little bit of an aside. So they're all going at each other here. Now, two Qantas's, just to take kind of Qantas aside here, to be play devil's advocate, the, the argument is that Qatar may well have all sorts of different um, uh, businesses, parent companies behind them. They are essentially a state-owned thing. And Qatar, as a state, as a country, however you want to see it, have an almost infinite amount of money. During um, covid when you had Qantas pretty much forced to shut down pretty much all international flying, apart from their kind of um, uh, 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 
recovery sort of missions the government put them on. Um, Qatar was one of the only airlines in the world actually increasing their schedule. And they made a big play about, you know, Qatar can still take you home. And the one of the reasons they were able to do that is they have this, I say, almost infinite amount of money to be able to see that, that kind of PR opportunity. So that the argument is if you let Qatar in, you are actually skewing the market because they're not able to, op- they don't have to worry about operating in the normal profitable terms of any other airline. So that's why Qantas is saying, well, hang on a minute, if you let them in, then you're skewing the market against us. And that's just not fair. And that will long term damage Australian airlines. And that will long term make things worse for Australians. Because if you do that, and you damage us, and you damage not just us, but other competition too, then if they decide to pull out at some point or reduce it, then what's going to be left? That's the argument Qantas would make. Uh, now, one thing that was put to, to, to Alan Joyce and to the, the other people from Qantas um, was that, uh, that, that letting Qatar in, and this is something that, that Virgin says, letting Qatar in, letting Qatar increase um, frequency would bring airfares down mm. into into the Middle East and Europe because there would be you know more competition, more people flying those. Um, what Alan Joyce effectively said was, he was asked, you know, do you think that letting Qatar in would bring airfares down? What he basically said was, these airfares are coming down anyway yes, because carriers like Singapore and Emirates and Cathay Pacific, they're all, you know, in increasing their capacity. Um, What he also said was, Qatar doesn't have to increase frequency to increase capacity. Why does he? What one thing he asked was, why does Qatar not fly bigger planes into Australia? For example, they've got A380s. He says, why doesn't why don't they why don't they fly more three more A380s? He says, why don't they fly more to you know destinations outside Sydney, Melbourne, Perth? and, you know, we covered a bit uh, a while, a couple of weeks ago, about these so-called ghost flights that Qatar have been operating uh, to places like Adelaide as a final destination, where the suggestion is that they're really doing this to get into Melbourne. Um, but he he's saying if Qatar wants to increase capacity into Australia, there are ways that they can do that without putting on more flights. And or, the, uh, sorry, yeah. or p- putting on more flights to the majors, which would require sort of a renegotiation of these air rights. What Qantas are kind of fortunate about is that this 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 kind of kerfuffle has come now because what we are seeing is a very strong bounce back in international travel and in fact far quicker than we would have estimated a year ago or even six months ago. So we're now seeing a situation where international travel has, um, ha- has kind of beaten the domestic bounce back and that is because we have seen so many carriers um, allowed back in. So I think that I can see both of the points. I think Virgin are right are saying that you would have a reduction in fares if you increased um, Qatar's flights. And but also arguably, it would give Virgin a bit of a leg up. Yeah, wow, well, this is, yeah, this is the thing, isn't it? They don't mention that. Um, but it, 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 it would be the argument is that's a short term thing. Long term, the argument is that capacity is returning to the market. And for any of you that are trying to book a international flight, Now, you will see that it is, yes, costing you more than 2019 prices, but it's also now significantly less than it was costing you um, back in January. And I think we spoke about this on on the show a couple of weeks ago. Um, A kind of semi-colleague of ours, Daniel Croft, who sometimes writes for Australian Aviation, he's actually in a... We need to do a proper shout-out for him next week. He's in a very cool band in Sydney, and they are touring Germany next month. So a couple of weeks ago, me and him were kind of like looking at flight. We were actually working really hard for anyone from the businesses. (laughs) listening uh it's aviation related it's okay yeah exactly Uh, um and we were looking at flights and we managed to get his whole trip um to germany and back and all the kind of internal travel um around europe done for just i think he was he got it from like two thousand three hundred dollars which pretty good pretty good pretty good so the argument is that prices are coming down anyway look prices are coming down but i I, I'll, i'll say my piece now on this whole thing this is a really old argument that keeps resurfacing. So Qantas did something similar when Emirates first entered Australia, something similar when Etihad first en- entered Australia, and doing it again now that Qatar are wanting to expand. The flip side of this coin is a couple of things. Number one, it's in Qantas's benefit if Qatar get more flights because Qatar is also a, a one-world member airline, So, which means Qantas can put their passengers. This is a very murky love triangle, yes. Exactly. It's a really murky love triangle. My argument with Virgin, while it might benefit Virgin, at the end of the day, it's not a Virgin aircraft. It's not Virgin crew. So all Virgin are doing is on-selling their own airfare to another carrier. 
through a code share agreement. So at the end of the day, passengers not getting on a Virgin Australia aircraft and getting a Virgin Australia service or crew. They're getting a Qatar aircraft and a Qatar crew. Not that Virgin flies to Europe anyway. Exactly right. However, Virgin used to have long-haul aircraft. They did. But the the argument was here, when they went into administration and they kind of popped out the other end, was to effectively end their very long-haul international travel. I would argue that, yes, you are not getting on a Virgin uh, uh, aircraft, but does the average punter know or care? They go on the Virgin website, they make their booking, and it all seems like a smooth journey. The reason why Virgin want this is they want to be able to say that we are basically still a big international airline in Absolutely. one way or the other. It, it, it benefits them in that way. And, look, they, they do have code share agreements with a lot of other airlines that can still get their passengers to Europe. So I, I, this is a really old argument. And Qantas is, of course, a code share partner with Emirates. Exactly right. So, you know, if anything, Qatar flying more services into Australia will benefit Qantas even further because then they've got two of the Middle Eastern carriers tied up really well in a, in a partnership agreement. Qatar through One World Alliance, Emirates through its code share partnership. So... Well, I'll tell you what. So we've obviously already extended the invite to Alan to do his exit interview. Mm -hmm. Um, Jane Halicka, if you are listening to this, we'd love to have you on the show too. At the same time. Why not? Well, that would be fun, wouldn't it? Ding, ding, step in the ring. (laughs) That would be great. And get John Sharp in here as well. (laughs) And then we just just lock the door and leave them for like like 45 minutes and and see see who comes out the other side. It'll be like Big Brother, the very clever can live feed. Three airlines enter, one airline leaves. (laughs) Who, Who leaves? you decide. <laughs> right, now let's wrap this up. We, we, we're going to have to miss out a lot of different things, but before we uh, end the show, one final um, story that, that, that came our way today, and this is that Western Sydney Airport is to operate a new plug-in hybrid fire trucks. Yep. Um, this is obviously a, a an audio, it's an audio-visual experience, but I mean, these fire trucks, Jake, they, there's a lot about them that's new. The main thing that struck me is the colour. What, yeah, what's going on? They're yellow. What? They're yellow. Yellow. They're yellow they're fire, fire trucks. Truck yellow. But yellow. Yellow at least, fire these, ones, at least these ones, yeah. the, the, the models that we have been shown, yeah. are painted yellow. It is possible that they yeah. will be painted red. But uh, if they're going with yellow fire trucks, I don't, I don't that. know. No. No. Well, I will tell you quickly, because I, I don't want to draw this out or, or steal Jake Sunder on a great story, but traditionally most aviation rescue fire trucks all around the world are yellow. Oh, wow. Oh, well, now, there you go. It's that very makes rare silly, to get a yeah. red fire oh. truck at an airport. So what so, you're saying is that me and Jake, you see ourselves as two of the topmost uh, aviation experts in Australia, don't have a clue what we're talking about. No, you you know a lot. Like God. No, but not on this I don't. On this I've not got on a very the, basic on the rescue detail very side. Um, I will make it my challenge this yes. week to go on Google as to why they're yellow. Yep. I think it, it's, it comes down to easily recognisable in, in a... In an emergency scenario, but um, traditionally worldwide aviation rescue fire trucks are yellow and the fire trucks that come in off field are your traditional red that is why you're on the show. That is what and, we got you in for. We, we are we are two members today of the of the lucky ten thousand. So if you have ever <laughs> if you have a uh, read a, a web comic called XKCD, you'll know what we're talking about. If you don't, then read that particular XKCD comic, and you will become one of the lucky ten thousand for that. I have no idea what you're about. <laughs> Neither do I. Um, this might well be time to wrap up the show. Do we have any shout-outs, anything before we... No shout-outs this, no shout this week, but uh, we will have some shout-outs coming up, especially with the awards coming yes. up this week. A uh, bit of a shout-out, um, uh, something we didn't cover, but a bit of a shout-out to Bonza. Um, Bonza is launching, uh, for the first time, a route outside the the, the, the traditional mainland eastern seaboard. They are going to uh, Launceston from the new base on the Gold Coast. Um, coup as well for Launceston Airport, you know, getting getting that Bonza flight Um I did speak to to Shane O'Hare from from Launceston Airport on one of our premium podcasts uh, a little while ago, um, and he was coy on the subject of Bonza. But uh, Bonza is is going to be going to Launceston, uh, first Tasmanian route. Um, hopefully, we'll see some uh, more sort of expansion, um, sort of outside the 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 Sydney, uh, so, so, sorry, outside the Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria. Uh, side of things, and you know, maybe further west to, towards Adelaide and Perth. Um, they've got the Maxes. The Maxes can go the distance. Well, well done to Bonza. Yeah. Well done to Bonza. Well done to the Bonza legends. Well, on that note, we will wrap things up for this episode. Um, and before I go, I will thank my two co-hosts. Chris, thank you very much. Thanks for having me back, Adam. And Jake, thank you very much. Pleasure, Adam. And we will be back on this show the same time next week. But for now, from us, goodbye. Bye-bye. <laughs>